give you an idea of obviously because of welfare reform and all the changes that came in. Um, one of the biggest changes that was to come in under welfare reform was universal credit. And the biggest problem, as Sue mentioned before, was that was going to be digital by default. So 80% or more of claims were going to have to be made online. Um, not everybody had access to IT. Even if they've got access to IT, a lot of people have never used IT. So straight away there's a barrier there on being able to make a claim. Um, people have never had an email address. They don't know how to set up emails because you're managing your claim online. Um, so you can imagine the difficulties and the barriers that's going to put first and foremost in front of people. Um, being requested to do job search as well requires using a computer. So there were more and more things that were moving towards IT. Um, so, so with having the knowledge that Universal Credit was going to come rolling out, we looked at, as a bureau, what are we going to do to sort, sort of like preempt the problems our clients are going to have um, and how are we going to best be able to help them. Um, Job Centre Plus um, libraries may have access to computers, but unfortunately that's all they will provide is the access to the computer. If somebody um, has got pro problems or questions with the application they're filling online, if they're making a claim for benefit, there's nobody there to ask, well, what do I answer here? What does this mean? What does that? And if an application is filled in incorrectly, that's obviously going to cause many delays or in some cases have penalties issued because an incorrect application has been submitted. So what we looked at uh, was ahead was sort of like changing our volunteer group that we normally recruit. And we identified that we would recruit what we call digital mentors, which was a completely different type of volunteer for, for citizens of Bangalore, for our bureau in North Liverpool um, anyway which meant the volunteers we were recruiting wouldn't actually be delivering advice, they would just be solely helping people um, with IT um, and digital applications, um, looking for job search, accessing government online services, um, accessing information sites, um, and also looking at finding better energy deals, looking at comparison sites, anything that could cut their costs to get a better deal. Um, so we actually started looking at recruiting um, to, to get a core group of volunteers that we would have that when people were coming in we could actually assist them and help them with that and be on hand to give them some uh, advice and information on other things that they could possibly do. Uh, following on from that we actually applied to TUC Union Learn to become a digital hub. Um, and our application was successful for that and three of our staff actually attended training um, with TUC Union Learn um, to become uh, very similar roles to the digital mentors, what they're called digital champions. Um, and they would be providing people with the same kind of service, um, with, with receiving um, equipment from them and also um, internet access. Um, for a 12 month period in order to assist people to make these applications because obviously everything is moving over um, to IT. Um, and so at the moment we've got this core group of volunteers now. Although Universal Credit didn't come in um, when it was expected to, we're also seeing other problems now. As Sue mentioned before about employment support allowance, um, we've got massive changes that have come in um, with welfare reform and uh, one of those changes is the um, appeal system um, and the way appeals are, of, 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 uh, the way appeals are lodged with the Department of Work and Pensions uh, that's completely different now um, where people are going to have to uh, make a mandatory reconsideration and claim an alternative benefit in the meantime. Now the majority of those people are going to claim job seekers allowance and again, job seekers allowance is 80% digital. So it means 80% of the applications are all made on computers. So although we haven't got universal credit coming in, we know that we're going to have massive amounts of people that are going to require help filling job seekers allowance forms in as well. So that's just one initiative we've taken the step to sort of like to be able to help our clients. Because no, normally Citizens Advice Bureau have always looked at CAB as being an advice agency. Um, but there's a lot more strands to CAB what we actually do and this is sort of a new area for us is to be able to be assisting people in different ways. Um, another initiative that we've actually um, brought in again on looking at welfare reform um, is as Sue mentioned a big part of our work is benefits and one of the massive changes that have come in is regards to incapacity benefit which moved to employment support allowance. 
that in itself has caused a huge amount of problems and people uh, find themselves on this never-ending merry-go-round, it's like a swinging door, they're making their application for benefit, they go for medical, they get no point, they go to tribunal, they win it, then they get sent to review form, they fill their form and they go for the medical, they don't get their points, they go back to tribunal and it's just this never-ending cycle because once they've got their benefit, there's no guarantee, it's only given for a period of time. The computer's already inputted with their next review date. And more often, what you find is somebody could go to tribunal. As Sue gave an example of somebody getting 50 odd points as compared to nil when they have the <coughs> assessment. What we find is some people go to tribunal, win their benefit, it's backdated, but within two to three months, they're back in the bureau with their review form because the computer has generated their review. They go for the medical within a few weeks and they get no points again. So three months ago, they got 57 points by um, a, a, a tribunal hearing. And that's the never-ending cycle that they're on. Now, obviously, these forms people fill in, they're very lengthy, they're quite complicated, and they're very daunting for a person to fill in. Um, and a, a good, completed form can often mean that um, there's more chance of the person actually securing benefit. And what we're finding is there's such a demand on the CABs and all of our agencies to fill these forms in, they're called the SA50. Um, it's taken up the majority of our appointment requests, that's all that's coming through the door all the time. And if you've got a client suffering with mental health issues, sometimes you could be with that client for three hours filling that form in. So you can imagine the volume of time that advisors are spending with these people as well. So obviously what we've looked at is obviously we need more resources to actually assist us with this. Um, and what we're currently doing is at the moment we're working with Liverpool University Law Department um, and it's um, students who are on law and social justice course, uh, first, second or third year students. Um, and basically what we've done is we've flagged up a volunteering opportunity with them. Um, the, the university have agreed to accredit some of the, um, the course, the training that they're going to be doing with CAB. And what we've been doing is we've devised a training program um, and we're actually training um, law students at the moment specifically just how to fill in these ESA 50 forms. Obviously we're giving them a background of um, welfare benefits and we're looking at how employment support allowance fits into that welfare benefit structure. Um, and obviously um, we had 97 applications when we first put the advert out and we obviously we looked at the applications and, and we sort of whittled that down to 42 which we felt was more a manageable amount um, and up to now we've still got 36 people who are still on that train and so hopefully um, the, next, the next session when that finishes they'll come into Bureau, do some observations and then we're going to have some students that are going to be able to assist us um, with actually providing that service for the ESA 50s. So that's another initiative that we're looking at, obviously looking at welfare reform, uh, where we know there's that demand for the service. So the resources that we've got, we're obviously restricted. We are a volunteer service. The majority of our advice is delivered by volunteers. So you can imagine we have a turnover of volunteers. Um, and sometimes we're feast or famine. Sometimes we can have loads and people move off for various reasons, the majority of the time they leave for paid employment. So we're constantly recruiting new volunteers all the way through. So this is just a, another role that we've actually developed in Bureau to assist our service users um, under the current climate because they're the issues that are coming into us. Um, in addition to that, um, from Liverpool University via Interchange, we've actually recruited a research student um, he's in his final year, in his third year, and what he's actually going to do with us is um, he's come in with us now in our bureau. He's looking at all our, every client that we see, we record all their issues, and all their issues are broken down into what we call um, social policy codes. So the codes will identify what type of issue that client has. So he's looking at and through our system now, and we've asked him to do a, a piece of work for us, a social policy report on the impact of bedroom tax with people. So he's currently working with us now. Um, he will interview some clients, get some background information, he will look at all our social policy forms, um, he'll look at all our codes, he'll research it all and he's going to produce a social policy report from us which is going to be based on factual information based on how people are suffering because of the, um, the bedroom
bedroom tax. Um, another initiative that we're working on at the moment is we're currently working with the, the GMB union. Um, I think this came about that because Alfie um, had said that there were lots of current uh, members and ex-members that were contacting the union um, with non-union related issues, not related to employees. It was more social problems, um, problems with their finances, benefits, various things like that. And it's an area that they identified that they were um, not equipped with the skills to be able to answer or assist. They were trying to do their best. Um, and all credit to, to Alfie, I think this is the first union that's actually gone down this road. And, and what they've done is approached CAB, um, ourselves, North Liverpool CAB and South Liverpool CAB. Um, and there's a core cool group of 14 volunteers from the GMB that have come forward and they're going to volunteer. Um, in their own time, alongside either their own job or if they're retired. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to be workplace advice assessors within their workplace. And we've got a combination of, um, we've got union reps, we've got union officials. Um, Neil at the back, who's the um, policy officer, he's on the course, Alfie's on the course, Johnny was here before, he's on the course. And basically what we're, we're doing with them is, uh, they're going to be workplace advice assessors, but what obviously, what do they do, how do they start doing this? So we've, we've drawn up a structured training plan over eight weeks, um, and we're looking at various aspects of them actually going through the training plan programme, looking at the types of issues that people have obviously have, have been coming to them. Um, we've looked at sort of like the ethical framework of advice, um, we've gone through sort of like key skills required for interviews. We've gone through the main inquiry areas of what types of issues people are going to come to them, because this is not going to be employment related, it's going to be other issues. Like Alfie said, there are lots of people coming with sickness and disability benefit issues, retired members who are now elderly, um, looking at disability benefit benefits like attendance allowance. Um, and obviously, they felt that they were completely out of their scope. Um, so the course is going to look at in-work benefits as well, it's going to look at sickness and dis disability benefits. We're looking at money management, so there'll be like financial capability that will be there on the course as well. Um, and the whole idea of that is to actually, is to equip these work-based assessors with information and with some knowledge so that when they've got members or ex-members coming to them, they know what they need to do, what information they need to gather, background information, identify emergencies, whether that's debts, whether it's court hearings, whether it's time limits on um, taking any action against benefit decisions, but it's also looking at where they can find information to help people looking at online services, we've gone through with them, uh, different sites they can go through, Citizens Advice um, have got a website Advice Guide so they can get lots of factual, lots of fact sheets off that. So we've gone through where they can actually get information for self-help to be able to help their members. But also what they're doing as part of the assessment is identifying um, what their next step would be. Um, so they will know that they would need to maybe refer somebody on because they're going to need more direct interview, further steps, advice, or there may be negotiations with third parties that need. And that's where the source of like the connection with CAB and the networking is coming, the partnership working because they'll be able to contact CAB and be able to, they've done the initial groundwork, you know exactly what it is, and we can take the referral from them, and then we can pick up them and provide a, an advice appointment or refer to a special housing worker um, or a debt worker or whatever the issue is. So that's sort of like a, another initiative we're actually working with. And I think Sue's on the course as well, although you're not GMB, Sue, are you? You're TUC. Oh, sorry, GMB now. You asked TUC when the course started. So, as I say, that, that's, um, I think that's breaking ground for the GMB, Alfie, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something new that they've identified that it's another service that they're looking at where they can see there's a gap that's not being provided for union members and ex-members. Um, so, hopefully, you know, that will, that will move along quite nicely. But we're sort of halfway through that course at the moment. We're on day four. And the third day of that course involved all of those that are attending the course actually coming into the bureaus. Um, and they were actually observing the advice sessions happening, uh, which is very similar. We, we call them gateway as, as assessments. 
Um, so they were able to shadow alongside gateway assessors and see the types of issues, see what types of information was being given to them, where people were being directed, so if it was self-help appointments that were being booked in, or whether it was simple just advice being given to them for them to, to go off and to help themselves. So they're just sort of some of the um, initiatives that we're working with. Um, another big part of work that citizens advice do, we're not just an advice giving agency, a big part of our work is social policy work. Um, and our social policy work is um, where we identify um, that there is bad practice, um, poor, bad custom, uh, legislation, regulations, anything that we're finding that our clients are suffering from um, and we need to bring about change. So what we do is we record social policy issues when we identify issues such as that. We record them um, in Bureau and we send them down to our central policy unit which is down in London. Now we've got over 400 CABs throughout the country but there's more than 3,000 in the country with all the different outlets that all those bureaus have got. Now collectively they're collecting all that social policy evidence that's going down to our central policy unit in London. So they can obviously flag up trends that are coming in from all over the country on the same issue that's coming up time and time again. And basically what they will do is they will gather the evidence, put it into a report, and we have social policy officers um, who are parliamentary officers over in the House of Parliament. So the information can go over and it can be given to MPs and it's based on factual information. It's not hearsay or it's just figures plucked out from thin air. It's been collected nationally from CAB and it's all fact-based evidence and hopefully we can give those reports, challenge the policy makers, have meetings with them and obviously bring about change and get things changed so that people are no longer suffering. Um, as part of our social policy work I'll just go through some sort of like social policy local campaigns that we're actually doing with our clients at the moment or on behalf of our clients. Um, just to give you an example of, of how social policy can actually work, um, Sue made reference earlier on to um, local authorities bringing their own schemes in to replace crisis loans that used to be administered from the DPWP. Um, crisis loans um, were available for anybody who has an unforeseen crisis so you could apply and receive a cash amount for whatever crisis you were in. Obviously those, the DWP have got rid of that scheme and it's been transferred over now to local authorities and each local authority across the country is administering their own scheme. So, I mean, where we are in Liverpool, we've got neighbouring councils, sort of like Sef, we've got Liverpool, we've got Sefton, we've got Nosley, um, we've got Wirral, so just the immediate councils that are around us, they're all operating different schemes. So it could be quite difficult sometimes when you've got clients coming in, depending on what postcode they're under, they could be under a different council. But the scheme that Liverpool City Council have got at the moment, <coughs> people can apply for an urgent need payment. Um, or they can apply for a home award if items of furniture or white goods that they require. The scheme rolled out in April um, and we found there were massive problems with the scheme. Um, and there were delays in the processing of the applications, there was problems accessing the scheme because it was just telephone only. Obviously if people are looking for an urgent need payment, they've got no money, they've got no credit on mobile, they're trying to make an application, they need to make that telephone call and make the cost to them. When the scheme initially rolled out, we were sort of like people were waiting over an hour to be connected. And then when they were connected through to it to somebody who would take their application, their application could take nearly 45 minutes. So you've got somebody with no money, needs an urgent need payment, they need money for food, gas and electric, and that's the system that they were actually going through. Fortunately, if they didn't have a phone, they couldn't make their application because in order to make the application, you need a reply, and they reply back to you mobile. Now, what they do is, if you're successful, they send you a message that has a barcode, and that barcode you take to a local shop that operates these pay points. You give them your mobile phone, they scan it, it tells how much, you, and you get your money, and that's how it works. <coughs> so you can imagine there were lots of barriers people were having straight away to try and, and, and access that scheme. So what we've done is we collected a lot of evidence, we've done a social policy report and then we met with um, the director of benefits for the local council, the local city council. 
and also the service managers who administer that scheme. And we presented that report to them and we showed them the evidence and we showed all the problems that there were with the scheme. Now since April, through the partnership working with Liverpool City Council and the evidence that we gave them, uh, they've took on board the recommendations that were in our social policy report. And we're now seven months down the line and it's not just a scheme that's there, there's long delays in access by telephone now. Um, they've worked with us, they took our recommendations on board and what they've done is they've widened it out now. So they've now provided a free phone number um, for BT customers only. Um, but at least people can access through a telephone box. Um, there's a free phone number now so the client isn't burning the cost. They've put more staff onto the scheme, so waiting times now to be connected are down to about three to seven minutes. Um, they've provided more additional training to their own staff and they've brought the application process down now. Um, and they've broadened out rather than just sending these text messages to people, they've actually opened it out to seven different one-stop shops in Liverpool now where people can actually go in and collect their voucher rather than having to borrow a phone um, or use a relative's phone uh, in order to get that message. So that's just sort of a bit of an idea of how our social policy has worked and how that's been successful in Liverpool. Um, another initiative that we're working with, um, again, is with Liverpool City Council, and that's our bailiff working party. Um, we've had that in place for five years, um, and that came about because we were identifying lots of issues with people who had council tax arrears. The accounts had gone out to various firms of bailiffs for them to collect. And what we were identifying was across all the different firms was issues of malpractice were coming to our attention, um, rogue bailiffs, um, bailiffs who were threatening uh, people, um, bailiffs acting outside of the powers that they had. Uh, but not only that, we were seeing that loads of illegal charges were being applied to people's accounts. Um, there's a set procedure that they can apply charges for whatever part of the recovery action stage that they're at. But what we were seeing is that they were putting all of the charges on. Um, you know, if you've got 12 stages, they were putting all of the charges on, preempting that was the stage that they're going to go to. So obviously they were just adding those charges immediately to the debt that was owed to City Council. And lots of people were just negotiating payment arrangements with all these illegal fees being added. So again, we've done the same thing, we, we, we done a, we've gathered lots of evidence, we've done a social policy report, um, and we met with Liverpool City Council, many of the, um, the high officers in different departments, um, and from that we started a working relationship with them, and I won't tell no lies, it was quite strained at first, and it was difficult, but over time, they've sort of like, they've started working with us now. Um, it did take time to get there, but... From that, what happened was, from the evidence that we collected on behalf of our clients and input from various staff, what we've done is, um, when the bailiff's contract were coming up for renewal, they put the, the council put their contract out to tender. Um, the bailiffs have to abide by a code of conduct. Um, and what the council does, was they gave us their code of conduct and said, that's the one that we've got in place now. Change it and you put in what you think needs to be in that code of conduct, give it to us and we'll look at it, and if everything's fine, we'll go with that. So that's what happens as we put the new code of conduct in place with Liverpool City Council. Um, some minor adjustments, some changes were made, and that was rolled out. Um, I mean, obviously, from that, we also got contact names of all the different beta firms so we could contact direct. And that working part has been going on for nearly five years now. Um, and we meet three times a year. Uh, there's two of us from North Liverpool and there are four officers from Liverpool City Council and also a local councillor, Joe Hanson. And we meet three times a year and we will still bring issues. I'm not, you know, everything's not fine and dandy. We're still coming across, is across issues. But we've now got an avenue and a channel where we can actually sort those issues out straight away. And we're able to sort of help our clients now. Um, where all these fees are not being added, we've got negotiations where they will accept our financial statements and offer of payments coming through because they know that we've done a debt assessment process with people and they know that the offer that we're making is a realistic offer. Um, so the majority of the offers we're making, they're realistic, people can sustain those offers 
um, and they're able to pay off the um, council tax without bailiff enforcement continuing and the loss of their goods, basically. Um, and just a, a final one, um, again, is bailiffs. When Sue was talking about magistrate court fines, um, the massive problems that we were seeing with that um, were lots of the time was refusal to enter into payment arrangements and the huge charges that were being added on for unpaid court fines. What we were finding is sometimes people were having direct payments from their benefits to repay their fine. But if they moved to another ba benefit, all their direct payments stopped. So the fine was no longer being deducted and paid back. And you've only got to miss a couple of weeks and automatically it's given to bailiff. Now, we were seeing people that had got down to like 30 quid earning on a fine. It would go to bailiff and the next thing the bailiff is demanding four or five hundred pounds and the 30 quid, that's still outstanding won't accept a payment arrangement um, and those bailiffs collecting for an unpaid fine have got more powers than a bailiff collecting for council tax. So they can force entry, you don't have to be there, they can force entry, they can seize your goods. If they seize your goods and they sell them at auction, if it doesn't raise that 530 quid, they'll come back and they'll take another lot and resell them, sell the goods and get the money that they need to pay off that fine. So there were lots of problems that we identified and there were lots of issues that we thought, well, you know, if if, if we could work with the DWP and get something sorted out so that direct payments will continue when people move. We looked at uh, work that the Magistrates Court and the Fines Office could actually improve on their workings as well. So again, what we've done is we gathered a load of evidence locally, all on our clients, and then what we've done was we produced a social policy report. And then early on in the year, um, we met with representatives from the Magistrates Court in Liverpool. Uh, we met with um, head uh, of departments in Marston's bailiffs, because they the bailiffs who've got the contract for fines. Um, we met with um, a representative from the National Enforcement, Enforcement Agency. And what we've done is we sat around the table for several hours. We went through our reports, we went through all our issues. Um, and we've now got a working party now and from that they've actually started to work with us. They've recognised that there are inconsistencies with their working patterns, there are inconsistencies with the actual court fine officers as well. Sometimes it may depend on who you get to speak to, whether you get a result. They've also um, agreed to give us um, a list and identify clients they would deem vulnerable so that we know if there's vulnerability there, then accounts can be passed back. Um, and we've got another meeting that's due in, um, no, in December, which is a follow-up meeting from that first one. But they've also given us contact numbers now where CAB can phone direct to discuss individual cases. And we, we've forwarded that information now through the whole of Merseyside and Cheshire. Um, so the work that we've just actually carried out is now sort of like helping all of the people that are sort of like throughout Merseyside and the Cheshire area and it's also helping all the advice agencies within that catchment area because the, the, the new procedures and the new way of working it's not just with North Liverpool CAU so that's going to be the new procedure that they will put in place for everyone because they've identified that they're at fault and you know there, there are improvements that they can make so that's a bit of an idea on what social policy work we do locally how it can impact, how we can bring about change, um, and also looking at things that we're putting in place at the moment to obviously help all our client groups.